Beaumont Con K-16, The Sound of the Bell and the Seven-Paneled Robe. The main case, Master Uman said, The world is vast and wide like this. Why do we put on our seven-piece robe at the sound of the bell? Muman's commentary. Generally speaking, in practicing and studying Zen, it is most detestable to follow sounds and pursue colors. Even though you may become enlightened through hearing sounds and come to realize mind by seeing colors, that is the ordinary way of things. People do not know that for real Zen monks, when they are riding on sounds and becoming one with colors, everything is clear moment by moment. Everything is full of wonder, action after action. When you hear a sound, however, just tell me, does the sound come to the ear or the ear go to the sound? Even though you have extinguished both sound and silence, what will you realize here? If you hear with the ear, you cannot realize it. When you hear with the eye for the first time, it will become intimate. The verse, with realization, all things are of one family. Without realization, everything is separate and different. Without realization, all things are of one family. With realization, everything is separate and different. Master Muman lived in the 900s in China. He was very strict and severe with his students. This was the way he was trained by his teacher, Bokshu. Bokshu always kept the door to his son's end room closed. And he could judge by a student's footsteps as the student approached whether the student had enough realization to bother to let him to enter, whether it was worthwhile interacting with the student at all. If he thought there was some aspect of awareness, what we might call mindfulness presence, awareness, he would shout, come in! As soon as the student entered the room, he would grab him by the collar and shake him and say, say it! And if the student hesitated even a split second, he would open the door and throw him out. We all think, oh, those were the days of true Zen. But do we want to be treated with that kind of strictness? Do we want to be tested by walking into the lion's den over and over? Really? No. We don't even want to make our beds in the morning. We don't even want to refill the ice cube tray when we take the ice cubes out for ourselves. That's not even bodhisattva mind. That's just ordinary kindness to the person coming after you. Making our beds and refilling the ice cube tray is a clear sign of state of mind. How vast and wide is our state of mind? When Uman was studying with Bokshu, the first two times he entered the Sun Zen room, Bokshu threw him right out. And the third time, Bokshu slammed the door on Uman's leg, and Uman's leg was broken. And as Uman cried out in pain, Ah! He was enlightened. What was two became one. What was small became immeasurable. So what happens when we're in pain? We collapse down into a small world of I, me, mine, and worry, distress, anxiety. My leg fell asleep. Is it going to fall off? My shoulders are, are tense. It's terrible. I don't think I can sit here any longer. We admire these old masters and their courage. 
and yet, what do we really want for ourselves? When we work on a koan, we can take up each word as a koan in itself. The world, the world is vast and wide, the world. We ponder just the word world. What is our world? We have to be honest about what our world is. We move around in a traveling box called I, me, and mine. And we look out through a dirty windshield. And this is our view, like this, maybe a little bit to the side. You know, if somebody's passing, we look over our shoulder a little bit. We don't even have a rear view mirror in our box. We can never look behind us. That's an ignored part of reality back there. This is what we operate in. And we don't even look up. We don't really look down. We just look straight ahead. Sounds are muffled in that box, and most things can't touch us inside that box. We feel safe. We want to be touched, but we really don't want to be touched. We want to hear sounds, but we really don't want to hear the sounds of the world suffering. We feel safe in that box, like we do in a car traveling at 70 miles an hour down a freeway. Then something happens, an accident, a death, and the illusion of safety is shattered. Bokshu made sure that his students didn't feel safe. He was showing them the truth of the world. He made sure that they were alert, alert to the truth that anything can happen at any time. Does it help us to know, as we now suspect, that a terrorist could blow up the plane we're boarding? Where is our base then, knowing that this little box hurtling through the sky could be blown up? It helps, not if we're frightened and become phobic about air travel, but it helps if we realize the truth of impermanence, the truth of impermanence. This entire world is impermanent. We don't really get it, or there wouldn't be an issue with climate change. If we realize the truth of impermanence, if we realize how close death is, that perhaps death brushes by us several times a day, we don't know. And if we become determined to get to the bottom of the great matter of life and death in this lifetime, so that we can face this truth of uncertainty, and whatever emerges out of that uncertainty, moment by moment, with equanimity. That's wonderful. The world is vast and wide. How vast is our true world? How vast is our true body? The true width and breadth of our mind just vast and wide can be examined for days, weeks. Where does our body end? Where does our breath end when we breathe out? Where does the world of the trees end and our world begin? We have to look at this directly. Our minds are amazing when we use them well. We can think Portland, and instantly our mind is in Portland. We can think about a friend or a relative, and instantly our mind is there with them. As the Tibetans say, our mind has directionality and travels infinitely fast. That's amazing. Can we extend the qualities of speed and directionality to explore the true width and breadth of our body and our mind? The word why, the word why is one we ask ourselves all the time. Why did this happen to me? Why did he say that to me? 
Why do I feel this way today and differently tomorrow? Why can't I sit without any part of my body hurting? Maybe you're asking yourself, why did I come to this session? Well, we all need to ask that question periodically. Thirty-five years ago, when we moved to Oregon and we started doing session again, I remember every time I would drive to the place where we held session, I would think, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And then three days into the session, I would know why I was doing it. It's good to ask the question. This is not a cult. We need to ask questions. But we need to go beyond questions to answers, beyond answers to experiences, true experiences that will change our life. So maybe you're asking yourself, why did I come to this session? Why did I come back to a situation where I know my, e my knees will hurt, my back will hurt? Am I crazy? Well, in one sense, yes, you are crazy. Most of the world would think you are crazy to devote a whole week to this activity, this activity of non-activity, this non-producing, this non-becoming, just being. So we have to ask the question, but we have to go into the question, why did I come here? Something brought me here. What was it? What gave rise to that impulse to sign up for this session and travel here? And is that more true than this doubt that's coming up now, whenever it comes up during session? Where does the truth lie? Our practice demands that really look for the truth. Last session I read, I read a piece by Flora Courtois who had practiced at ZCLA for years, who had a spontaneous enlightenment experience, quite moving. She wasn't doing any Zen study. She was just boring deeply into the question of what is ultimate reality? What is ultimate reality? What is, what is this pe piece of paper ultimately? Is there anything behind it? Is it just a flat sheet of cellulose with dots of dark and light on it? Or is there something more to its existence? And can I see that? If I look with the inner eye, if I look deeply into this piece of paper, can I see its ultimate reality? The floor, your hand, the food in your bowl, anything. What is the deeper reality behind the superficial way we interact with the world. So when our mind says, I'm bored, we have to say, what is boredom? What are you talking about, mind? Are you bored with the air you're breathing? Are you bored with your sitting cushion? Are you bored with swallowing? Are you bored with blinking? Are you bored with the light in the room? What is boredom? Or when it asks, why did I come here, say, that's a very good question. Why did we come here? What was below signing up and getting in the car and coming here? For my high school graduation speech, I, the theme was, the unexamined life is not worth living. I was 16, I guess a portent of Zen study to come. The unexamined life, the unexamined life is not worth living. Nobody here is satisfied with living a superficial life, otherwise you wouldn't be here. You want to know what's behind everything. So this koan session is different, as I mentioned last night. It's more Rinzai style, although sitting facing the wall is Soto style, but it's different from our usual way of sitting. 
And it's good to have things turned upside down so that we're never quite sure what's going to happen. It's like going to session for the first time. We enter don't know mind, beginner's mind, rather than oh, predictable mind. Oh, yes. Let's see. The schedule says lunch will be at, and I know we usually have these things for lunch. And then I know that I usually get a rest after that. I know that during Kenyon I can slip out and go lie down and do some stretches. Or I can chant at a level where I'm comfortable and I don't have to worry about my voice getting hoarse. And you know, all those little considerations we have that begin to solidify our life, freeze our life. And we could feel safe. We feel safer about coming to session because we can predict what's going to happen. But is it really safe? No. What's safe is to be ready for any, anything, to be alert and aware and ready for anything. The wonder of anything arising. Bowen practice is basically a religious practice. Basically a religious practice. It's not an intellectual game, which some people think it is. It's not a practice of solving ancient Chinese riddles or the practice of learning a special symbolic language. Like, oh, like we study dreams and we say, oh, water and dreams, that means spirituality and snakes mean this and so on. It's not, it's not that. It's not, oh, what does the seven-piece robe mean? What does the bell mean? It's not that. These are real questions, basic questions about the nature of our life. In fact, once you have a breakthrough, you understand that the old masters are not talking in riddles at all. They're talking about something that is obvious and always present, hidden right under our noses, hidden by the thick delusion created by our constant thinking. Our thoughts, which are full of comparing and judging, full of self and other. And this is what the verses of faith mind that we chant at noon are saying. The great way is not difficult for those who do not pick and choose. When preferences are set aside, the way stands clear and undisguised. All of our thoughts are dividing thoughts. All of our thoughts are dividing thoughts, even naming something. So when we talk about doing listening practice, at first, when we listen, the mind talks about what we hear. Oh, there's a car. Maybe I need to get gas in my car on the way home, blah, 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 blah. Then as practice takes over, then it's just recognize a car. But then as we go deeper into practice, it's just the sound. It's just the sound without even a name, because a name is a separation. There's me over here, and there's the car over there. It's a separation in space and in time. And as said in this koan, if you're still hearing with the ear, then there's still separation. Oh, my ear is here, and the sound is coming from over there. That's still separation. When you are the sound, then you're truly hearing. Or as Master Mulan said, when you see the sound, then you're truly hearing. So we always have to see what is in the way, what is in the way, and shave it away, let it go. One of the problems with the Rinzai approach is that people take it on as a battle, a battle with the ego. And that battle just reifies the self, reifies the ego. If anything, it makes it stronger. So this is very delicate way of coming along this path so that we see all the traces of self and we let them go, let them dissolve. Ignore them, not interested in what your mind is saying, not interested. A 
becomes like an annoying radio station or a crazy person sitting next to you on a park bench. Not interested. Or somebody next to you on the bus, as I said last night, or on the plane. When you've got something really important to do, which is to see, to experience the reality beneath the superficial. You have this really important task to focus on, to focus all of your effort on. And somebody next to you is trying to strike up a conversation. That's somebody being your mind. Don't pay it any mind. And when you find that you're lost in your mind, in its chatter, don't add anything extra to it. Don't add self-criticism. Don't add judgment. Don't add anything. Don't add anger or irritation to it. Just notice, oh, there, it's turned itself on again. Let it go. Turn it off. Dive back into the practice. All of our thoughts are dividing thoughts. I like this. I don't like that. I'm deluded. They're deluded. I'm defective. They're defective. The world is defective. Last session, we worked with the three aspects of mind. The mind of I mean mine. Is that the mind I'm in? I mean mine. As soon as we discover that, let it go. Or am I in the mind of the world is in a, is, is in a mess and there's no solution? Are we in that mind, which is slightly wider than I mean mine, but still self-focused, self-centered? Are we in the mind that can let that all go and be vast and wide? In Buddhism, we talk about taming the mind, the unruly mind, concentrating the mind, expanding the mind beyond its usual small box so that it becomes more and more clear of thoughts. Whether the word taming or cultivating or disciplining works for you, it doesn't matter. We have to work directly with our mind. But again, it's not a battle. Whatever we oppose becomes stronger by our opposition. We just notice, oh, mind turned itself on again. Turn it off. Go back to the practice. And gradually, what I call natural mind will open. A natural, open, relaxed, aware mind. Hmm. Thoughts drift in, but they're not, a, they're not bothersome. Because 95% of our awareness is awareness, not thoughts. Now, the first few days of any session, thoughts are going to be more bothersome. Sometimes very thick. Sometimes they carry us away. That's what happens. So we have to be very diligent about returning. Letting go, returning. Letting go, returning. When thoughts slow and stop, even for a few minutes, then awareness can step forward. Awareness, clear and bright. And then the truth is obvious. It's so obvious it makes you laugh and exclaim, how could I have missed this? Why haven't I seen this before? Single-minded concentration on a koan can help clear the mind of thoughts. However, koan practice is not a technique aimed at developing a clear mind or developing samadhi power, allowing you to set aside thought and flow with dance or music or be better at martial arts. That may occur. That may be a beneficial side effect of the practice of intense concentration, which is necessary to koan work. The three requirements for koan practice are the same as for all of practice. These are called the three pillars of Zen in the book of Yatsani Roshi and 
Kappa Roshi's teachings and Harada Sogaku's teachings called Three Powers of Zen. First is great faith. The first, in a way, the last is great faith. We have to have enough faith. We don't have blind faith. The Buddha said, if I hold a jewel in my hand behind my back and say, there's a jewel in my hand, why would you believe me? But if I hold the jewel out and put it in your hand and you hold it, then you can believe there's a jewel. So ultimately, that's true. Ultimately, we're not asked to believe in a creed that we recite. We're asked to investigate and find the truth for ourselves. But we have to have a certain amount of faith to undertake the practice at all. We have to have faith in the Buddha, that the Buddha existed, that the Buddha taught, that his teachings were beneficial, that they've been passed down over 2,560 years, and that they can be beneficial to us. So we have faith in the historical Buddha and in his Dhamma and his teachings. Which means we have faith in enlightenment. We have faith in the great mind, the great body mind, that it is there. We've caught glimpses. That's why we have some faith in it. We have faith in the possibility of enlightenment for everyone, including us. We have faith in the Dhamma means we have faith in the tools of practice, that if we use them, then our practice will bear fruit. We have faith in the Sangha, faith in our human teachers, faith in the people who support us in session. hardest thing to have faith in is yourself, that you can do this practice, that you can become enlightened. So we have to have faith in our own and everyone else's enlightened nature, essential enlightened nature and ability to awaken. So the first is great faith. And of course, as we practice, and the practice bears fruit, then our faith grows. Oh, this works. I've seen that it works. Or somebody tells us from the outside, gosh, you're different than you were six months ago or a year ago. That gives us more faith. Hmm? So we start with a tiny bit of faith, enough faith to keep on practicing and to come to session and to give it a good try for the whole of session. But then when the practice bears fruit, our faith grows. The second is great doubt. And in the case of koan study, great doubt arises when the koan can't, can't be solved right away. So you go in, you make an attempt at presenting the koan, and you're rejected. And doubt arises, first directed towards the teacher. I know I saw this clearly. They're, maybe they're just playing games with me. Or doubt arises towards Zen. This is so frustrating. This is stupid. I don't think that I'm suited to Zen. I like to read and study. I'm good at that. Tibetans do that. Maybe I'll go study with the Tibetans. They do a lot of study. Or towards doubt towards the ability of koans to work. I was never good at riddles. I'm much happier doing breath practice. So this isn't even great doubt. This is skeptical doubt. Skeptical doubt which divides and limits us. But when you have to keep working on a koan, when you put yourself in a situation, in a way a totally artificial situation, but when you put yourself in a situation where you accept the koan, deeply in your being, and you accept that you have to work on it, then that doubt turns back on the koan itself.
and you become deeply dissatisfied in a fundamental way, compelled to keep working on the koan until it opens. That's when it becomes great doubt, and this great doubt drives you to look at the koan again at a deeper level, and then again and again. It becomes like a drill down through all the layers that have been added on top of essential, our essential experience of this life. Great doubt is based upon faith. It's based upon the faith that you can quiet your mind. You can plunge deep into the flowing stream of Prajnaparamita wisdom. And you can experience the resolution of your doubts and your distress. So great faith and great doubt. And the third is great determination. Undoing a solid, lifelong delusion takes time. How many time, how many years in this lifetime has it taken for this thick wall of delusion to build up, let alone past lifetimes, whether you regard them as your own lifetimes or your family history? It takes time to take down that wall of delusion and the path contains many obstacles. It wouldn't be worthwhile if it didn't. If enlightenment were easy, everybody would be enlightened. The small self wants to protect its existence. And just when you think, oh, my mind is getting so quiet, and I'm getting concentrated, then the self built of thoughts arises even stronger and it will fight back. It will try to dislodge us from the seed of Zazen. We have to keep on practicing steadily no matter what happens. No matter what happens. Great determination. Hakuin Zenji said the level ground is littered with corpses, meaning before it even gets difficult, people flee. Harada Roshi told me this, this session. He said, he, his, he was talking about how master carvers carve Buddhas out of wood, that they pick a tree and a section of that tree to carve a Buddha. And the carving of a Buddha means removing what's extra. And he said, always the, the, the good wood for carving a Buddha has some kind of twist or turn, what we might call in ourselves a defect. But always it has that. That's what makes it unique and beautiful. And the master carver has to see the Buddha in that wood and remove what's extra, what's not needed. But he said uh, the difference between a master Buddha carver and the work that we teachers do is that people can get up and run away. I mean, wood can't do that. So it takes great determination. I want to get enlightened. I know I can get enlightened, at least make progress on the path towards enlightenment in this lifetime. And I will not be turned back and deterred by whatever arises. It takes that kind of determination if you want to see this through. Remember the Buddha, just when he was on the verge of enlightenment, Mara sent sexual temptation, sent attacking armies, sent doubts. Who are you to claim enlightenment? And sent the temptation of great worldly power. Interestingly, some of those temptations were the same as for Christ, the devil confronting Christ. Just when we're sitting so still and open and quiet, Mara mind sends these temptations, sexual fantasies, recalling times when we felt under attack, planning revenge for those who attacked us, fantasies of power. Just when we seem to be making progress, that's when Mara attacks. 
just as it did for the Buddha. We think, oh, my mind is so quiet now. I feel enlightenment around the corner. What will it be like when I get enlightened? Oops. Feed your mind back to my breath. Back to Shikantaga, back to the goal. Just oops. Not, oh, how terrible I am. Just oops. Back. Somebody was telling me before session about a cartoon relevant to practice where the cartoon character says, I was so in the moment. I'm going to blog about how I was so in the moment. I was really in the moment. That's what our mind does. Hmm? Frustrating. Frustrating. But we just have to laugh. Oh, silly mind, shut up. Going back to my practice. Ordinarily, people who want to work on koans are assigned one of the foundational koans. These include mu, and what is the sound of one hand, and original face. So mu, sound of one hand, and original face are usually the foundational koans. They're phrased as a question, because the question catches the mind. What is Mu? What is Mu? At this moment, what is Mu? What is the sound of one hand? And with all koans, you reduce it down. What is the sound? Or just sound. What sound? What sound? Original face is before your parents were born. What is your original face? Before your parents were born, before your grandparents were even born. What was your original face? What did you emerge from? What will you return to when you die? These koans are also called breakthrough koans because if you work on one of them diligently, if you throw yourself into the question, if you become obsessed with the question, if you carry it with you at all times, if it becomes the first thing in your mind in the morning when you awaken, and the last thing in your mind as you fall asleep, if the, koan, if the question arises many times during the day, is this the sound of one hand? Is this my original face? If you become the question itself, if there's no separation between you and the question, you are the question, you can completely break through the delusion of a small lonely self, and experience in the most vivid way your true, unborn, and undying life. Once that breakthrough has occurred, then you're given pecan koans to keep the door open, and also to seek out the many areas of unclarity, the little corners of uncertainty and unclarity that always remain after a breakthrough, and to clean them up. So these koans are called kikan koans. Kikan means dynamic action. They cannot be answered in words, only in action, because words separate you again. They have to be demonstrated. The word kikan comes from a weaver's loom, implying the dynamic action, like the, the, the shuttle going back and forth when someone's weaving something. The dynamic action of awakened person, of an awakened person in the situations that arise in everyday life. Kikan koans help take someone who's had some kind of realization through the detached mind of samadhi and bring that realization to life. It's of no help to the world if it's just a detached state, if we remove ourselves from the world. It has to function in the world, in life. If realization doesn't transform you, if your openings don't make you a better person in your everyday life, then those experiences, those openings are just entertainment. 
another form of entertainment. Another form of buffing up the self. Oh, I had an opening. Oh, good for you. What's your life like? Are you filling the ice cube tray when you take ice cubes out? Some examples of Kikan koans are walk straight along a path that has a thousand curves, or absorbed in the flight of birds, he sees mindlessly, or how do you stop the sound of a distant temple bell, or empty-handed yet holding a hoe. These are not to be talked about, not to be thought about intellectually. We have to plunge in, past the words, past the vision, into the unity of that vast mind. And then bring the question in, the koan in. How do we experience it from that country, that territory, that reality? During this session, I would like everyone to work on the koan Mu. You don't even have to know the story behind Mu. Just let Mu take over your body, become your breath. When you're breathing, Mu all the way to the end. You wish move on the in-breath or let the move the in-breath just be the in-breath. And then move with every step, whether out loud or silent. When eating, move is putting moo into moo. Let Mu take over your body, become your breath, fill your mind. Every step, every bite of food, every movement during work, just Mu. Mu chops, Mu, 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 Mu. Mu digs, Mu, 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 Mu. Mu sows, Mu, Mu. Or brrr, Mu. Mu sweeps. When thoughts arise, put mu into the mind in the place of thoughts. When thoughts arise, oh, good, I forgot mu. Let the thoughts go. Bring that mu back in. Because working on mu can take months or years of very sustained, diligent effort, if you wish, you can take up a kikan koan too. So you have the option of just working on mu, if you'd like to do that for the whole of the rest of the session, which is fine. Or if you'd like to work on Mu as your background work, but also work on a Kikan koan for, for Sanzen, for coming into Sanzen, that would be fine. So ordinarily, we don't give Kikan koans until you've had passed the initial breakthrough koan. But because you have original nature within you already. And because it is that original nature that reveals the koan, that opens the koan, you can work on some of these preliminary kikan koans without having passed mu. I'm not sure anyone ever passes mu. Or without having a significant breakthrough. When you pass mu, you'll have to do these again anyway with completely fresh perspective. In fact, any koan you work on seriously is taken into your being and works on you from the inside forever. And through your lifetime may reveal different solutions or meanings at different times during your changing life and as your practice matures. So if you've really worked on a koan, it never leaves you. So here are the kikan koans you can pick from if you'd like to do a kikan koan. So some people have done some of these, so you don't do them again if you've already done it. 
First is hide yourself in a pillar. So there are some people who are new here, and that's often one we assign initially. Hide yourself in a pillar. The next is show me an immovable tree in a heavy wind. Show me an immovable tree in a heavy wind. The next is the earth revolves on its axis every 24 hours. Scientists tell us this, but at this moment, how do you know it? At this moment, how do you know the Earth's revolving? And the last is form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. It's actually two parts. We present form is emptiness. How do you experience that? Second part. Emptiness is form. How do you experience that? So you may think, oh gosh, it's going to be hard to sit there and work on Mu, and then when do I work on hide myself in a pillar? Well, you work on Mu until your mind is quiet and clear, and then you can bring in hide myself in a pillar. What does that mean? What is that experience? Hide myself in a pillar. Maybe you work on it for a period. Or as you're, as you're doing Samu, as you're doing work practice, you think at this moment, what would it be to hide myself in a pillar? As you're walking around, hide myself in a pillar. How can I do that? What would that be like? Or at this moment, how do I, do, how do I know that the earth is turning? How would I show that? And your demonstration has to be clear enough, Yasutani Roshi used to say, that an illiterate Japanese peasant would know what you're presenting. So don't try this. That won't work. That could be the answer to any koan. Therefore, it's not the answer to any koan. It's got to be real for this koan. Hide yourself in a pillar. Present that. Show me an immovable tree in a heavy wind. How do you show an immovable tree in a heavy wind? What is an immovable tree in a heavy wind? As I'm sitting here doing zazen, what is immovable? What is a heavy wind? What is this? What is beyond, beneath this koan, beneath the words, immovable tree in a heavy wind? As I'm walking around, as my mind is driving me crazy, what is an immovable tree in a heavy wind? Or at this very moment, form, emptiness, emptiness, form. What, how is that manifesting? How do I see that? And then how could I show it? So, just to repeat, to make it clear, everyone is working on the fundamental koan here. And if you wish to make that your only koan, and you come in and you present mu, your experience of mu, that's totally fine. That's all you have to do. After 35, 40 years of practice, 35 years of practice, I use Mu all the time. I rely on you. I take refuge in Mu, especially if my mind is crazy, gets agitated. Mu has the energy of all the ancestors behind it, all the ancestors who've worked on it. Fantastically powerful koan. What is Mu? What is Mu? At this moment, what is Mu? Can I see deeply enough to see, hear, taste, touch Mu? What is it? But if you wish, and it's kind of fun, you can work on Mu plus a Kikan koan. And then you would present the Kikan koan in Sanzen. So you would try to lower yourself down into the essence of the koan. And then, how would I present my experience of an immovable tree in a heavy wind? So when you come into Sanzen, you don't need to say your name. I'm not interested in any history. You just say, my koan is mu, and you present. Or you come in and you say, 
my koan is an immovable tree in a heavy wind. And you present your experience of a movable tree in a heavy wind. That's it. Koan work is wonderful. Sort of in the same way, voluntarily undergoing surgery is wonderful. But there are lots of bits that need to be carved away so that your Buddha nature can be revealed and you can experience it for yourself. So please be willing to undergo the surgery called koan study, at least for this session. Thank you. <laughs>